Good evening and welcome. Tonight we have Tracy Carter with us, our Chief Nurse, and we are discussing Your Care, Your Views. This is part of our public engagement and we're very grateful to you for being with us this evening. So just to tell you a few things about using Zoom and how we're going to run the session tonight, we are asking um, that you don't use your cameras and you are all on mute and will remain so because we would like you to submit questions using the chat function, please. Don't hold back, do type your questions in as soon as you think of them. We will make sure that we have time for your questions this evening. And uh, it's important also to tell you that this session is being recorded and we will put it up, up on our YouTube channel later this week. If you do have a question, please use the West Hearts communications um, address and you will find it on your chat function. Thank you very much. So the aim of this session is to explain our proposals to you and to provide a little bit of in extra insight into our services. And that's why we're so grateful that our clinical staff are supporting these sessions that we're running. We want to tell you about how you can tell us your views and we want to talk to you about our engagement and give you an opportunity to ask questions. And we will also be asking you how we can talk to more people in our communities about our proposals. So if you have friends or a part of a group and you want us to come and make a presentation to you, then please do get in touch. So a little bit of background. I know there are some familiar names out there this evening, but if you aren't, um, if you haven't been following our, our very long now uh, attempt to secure funding, here's a little bit of background for you. We've been working with Hearts Valley's Clinical Commissioning Group to secure funding for a major redevelopment of our three hospitals. So that's our site at Hemel Hempstead, St Albans and Watford. In September 2019, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, announced that we were one of six trusts to receive funding via the National Health Infrastructure Plan. So if you ever hear us talking about HIP1, uh, that's that's what the, the HIP stands for and the one indicates that we're in the first wave. The programme is also referred to sometimes as the new hospital programme and it has grown to have eight trusts in and we are sometimes referred to as front runner trusts um, and we like that because it makes us feel that we really are very close now to securing funding and for people who've been at the trust for a long time they, they do say this is the closest that they've ever felt and the most confident that we've ever been to secure funding. So uh, it's not as easy as Boris Johnson just announcing that the funding will come our way. We have to convince our regulators, that's NHS England and NHS Improvement, that we have a good credible scheme that provides excellent value for money, it's affordable, and importantly can be delivered by 2025 or soon after. And for those of you who have visited any of our hospitals, you will know it's really important for us to improve our facilities. So although we may be very proud of the care that we give, we're a little, uh, a little embarrassed sometimes by the quality of our environment. And we really want to see that change as soon as possible. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, Your Care, Your Views is our public engagement programme and it comes from a history really of Your Care, Your Future, when we were talking to local communities about uh, different ways that we would want to provide care in the future. And we also have taken account of national policy, such as the NHS plan and local policy and strategy. And your care, your views really comes from our clinical strategy. And there is a partner document to that, which is the clinical brief. And that has a lot of detail around our services. So if at the end of this meeting or any of the other meetings you may come to, you want more information or to refresh your memory on our plans for which services will be provided on which site, 
then the clinical brief is a really good document for you to look at. And there are two engagement documents as well, one a little bit shorter than the other, essentially both very similar, uh, but just to give you um, a range of detail really. And um, you can see all, all these documents on our website. So uh, we use a phrase, or, or you might have heard the phrase, threes, two's company and three's a crowd. Well, we think three's company um, because we think our three hospitals can work very well together. Each hospital will have a unique purpose under our proposals. They do a little bit already, but we want to emphasise that more and create a unique role for each hospital. So the broad outline is for Watford General Hospital to be the site for our emergency and specialist and complex care, much as it is currently. St Albans, where we currently provide planned surgical care, will increase the range of sur surgery that we offer there, and we will also provide more cancer care at that site and an urgent care service. The asterisk there just indicates the fact that the minor injuries unit is currently closed just while we manage our response to the pandemic. And Hemel Hempstead we see as being the site for our urgent and planned medical care and for people with long term conditions. So urgent care services will be provided at all three sites, as will a limited range of outpatient services. And I'm now going to hand over to our chief nurse, Tracy Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, thinking about current challenges. So the configuration that we have um, at the moment means that a number of clinical staff can't always be called on when colleagues maybe need urgent advice um, or an opinion. Um, and that sometimes actually needs to take place in person. And also to be able to have that discussion with the information and the, the patient uh, present. So teams can feel really stretched across um, services when they're delivered across um, three hospital sites. Um, this can really link in with um, having reduced training opportunities, um, particularly for more junior staff as well, um, and limited opportunities, as I've said, around consulting with colleagues as well and working as a multidisciplinary team. Um, and also around how we cover services as well, um, so that we can make sure that we provide um, a range of services and access for our local community um, at all times and we don't have to um, cancel um, clinics um, and appointments which we know really have an impact on people's lives. Next slide please. So some of the benefits of consolidating services. So, you know, our proposals will allow speciality staff to work from fewer sites. Um, and also it will really enable building really strong teams as well within um, facilities that are fit for purpose, uh, not just fit for our staff, but fit for our local community as well to provide those services and tailored to their needs. Um, I really believe it will actually give people much more um, satisfaction about their day-to-day -day, um, working as well. And also um, absolutely happy staff equals happy patients. Um, and I think that really leads to um, retaining um, good skilled staff at all times um, as part of that. Um, being able to reduce cancellations um, and really having the presence of senior staff to support decision making, supervision, um, and again, building stronger teams as part of that um, with that senior presence. Um, having much more welcoming environment as well um, as part of that and um, areas where our staff can really rest. Um, 
and actually have time to um, have their lunch um, and really just um, be able to recuperate um, from um, the day's work as well as part of that. And actually our, our new buildings will really give that, will have the opportunity to have spaces that can be quiet spaces and also other interactive spaces where our staff can really relax um, as part of their, their breaks um, for the day. So I think it really does um, impact on morale and really making staff feel um, better um, in their how they um, are under able to undertake, I suppose, their day to day duties as part of that. So to consolidate and not duplicate services. So speciality teams will be grouped together um, and really be, be co-located. Um, as part of that, um, so they can provide the best care um, every day for patients. Um, making sure that we provide more um, what we would call one-stop clinics, so across speciality services, so that actually you can have procedures, you could have um, a CT scan or an MRI scan um, at the same time and be able to see um, a relevant specialist as well um, with the results of those um, diagnostic tests that you've had and talk about your treatment um, plan and the options available to you um, as an individual but you know also to you with your family and friends as well um, and that's really important to people. Um, I think, you know, in terms of patient experience um, and, staff, and staff satisfaction, I think working this way will really um, improve that um, and improve access for all. Next slide, please. So at Watford, um, as you can see here, um, really um, much improved emergency uh, services with specialist aspects to that as well. Urgent treatment centre, um, which you'll have he heard uh, called UTC, um, and a much bigger department as well um, with clear assessment areas as part of that to be able to, to manage um, people's needs um, and the needs of the local community using these services. Um, as you would expect, um, inpatient services um, as well as part of that. And I suppose it's important to equate that beds don't always mean services. Actually, services can mean uh, quite, it's quite broad and isn't just about actually having inpatient facilities. So high risk surgery um, and the need for co-location with critical care for those people that have higher um, acute needs um, and also, you know, may, may be unwell as part of um, a medical condition or emergency surgical interventions um, that they may need to have um, as part of that. Um, making sure that we've got services co-located with our emergency department, such as the fracture clinic um, and diagnostic services. So your CT scanner and other things so that we can really improve people's experience and flow through um, the emergency department. So that actually it means that you can see people in a more timely fashion, they get the specialist input they need um, as part of that. And that's really important. Um, looking at how we work as a multidisciplinary team and having space to be able to meet, have those discussions as well. And of course, what is always important to everybody to have really good car parking facilities to access the site. Um, and that's not just for you know, patients, that's staff, visitors, um, everybody um, as part of that. So you can see here about new specialist services such as inpatient um, neurology, um, as, well as, as well as inpatient chemotherapy and things as well. Um, so that people don't have to travel outside of the local area um, for um, those specialist uh, aspects to their care. 
and of course, um, you know, maternity, so, you know, services for women um, and babies, and obviously our um, paediatric services as well, looking after sort of high risk as well as low risk um, services, um, along with our um, neonatal um, intensive care and outpatient and inpatient services for children. So here we've got a lovely picture of uh, Vicky, who is our intensive care matron um, and also um, chair of our staff side uh, committee as well. And she's here really, you can read this and see that actually, you know, it's been a really tough year um, for, for everybody. And actually we have been pushed um, within the buildings that we have and it has, but then again, the pandemic has taught us huge amounts as she rightly says, um, around lessons for the future and how we really can build that into our um, planning. So it's a really exciting time for us as well as part of that. So our Hemel Hempstead hospital site will continue to provide urgent care services and broaden its range um, and volume um, for looking after people with long term conditions. Um, aspects around diabetes and uh, rheumatology and becoming the main site for those which is you know which will be fantastic for those services um, and also benefiting from a lot of enhanced technology as well um, which will help us in terms of planning care and treatment and also how we're able to access information and utilize that um, to the best of our ability to provide those services. Um, a number of outpatient services across the site as well. And as you can see, um, you know, real opportunities for access to good diagnostic services as well there. Um, and then um, having a number of the one-stop clinics that I've all, um, already referred to um, that would be located uh, on this site as well. Um, and again, um, the space for multidisciplinary working as well. And I think, you know, so in terms of that, uh, don't worry, don't worry, carry on. Um, so in terms of uh, our clinicians, as you can see, we've got uh, Sandeep Balara here, um, really talking about actually the difference that um, these services um, could make um, to Hemel Hempstead Hospital um, and actually being having, able to have those under one roof as part of that. Um, and as he rightly says, you know, good care um, good access to um, services isn't just about um, inpatient beds on our emergency sites um, this can be you know in a much better environment at Hemel um, where it's really calm uh, and considered and people can have the discussions and the time that they require. St Albans so um, again, a range um, of uh, surgery uh, across that site and also surgery that um, aspects of surgery that we haven't done um, on the site. So things like colorectal surgery, urology um, procedures and things as well as, as part of that. As many people will know, um, orthopedics has been a, a mainstay on the St Auburn site for uh, a number of years, but actually broadening the type um, of specialist surgery that we can provide on that site. Um, better and faster diagnostics as well with MRI and CT um, provision uh, there as well and nuclear medicine. So um, also um, on the location, having an endoscopy unit as well to support um, our cancer services and other specialities, um, along with gastroenterology and associated hepatology services as well. Um, and as Louise referred to at the beginning, um, around urgent care services and further uh, discussions that will be taking place from spring this year uh, to look at that. Um, and again, a number of one-stop clinics as well, and also having a, a cancer information centre um, available um, for people who are visiting the site and also for people to be able to drop in, find out information, speak to people um, as part of their care and treatment. So here we have um, Freddie Banks, who's one of our urologists, um, you know, really talking about the challenges of uh, having timely diagnosis um, because of the way our services are set out across the three sites. 
um, and giving you um, an example there around biopsies um, as part of that and the, and, uh, the time um, between appointments and things um, and the impact that that can have on patients as well. So if we have all of those diagnostics, the specialists um, co-located, that actually that can reduce that um, weight and improve people's experience of the service. So further opportunities. So um, really, you know, thinking about how our clinical services are organized um, within and uh, across our site. So some of the examples you can see here as well around um, the emergency department and having assessments co-located. Um, and this is really important in terms of trauma and really thinking of the golden hour. And when, you ha when you've had a trauma, um, you've come into the emergency department, you really want to know that actually everything is co-located, your diagnostics, so your CT scan, and the specialist there, so that actually we can assess you um, and undertake the relevant um, services um, that you require to make sure that um, you have the best outcomes possible. And this is extremely important as part of emergency care. So really thinking about women's and children's services, you know, closer to the emergency department um, and also areas such as theatres and diagnostics. Um, and this is, this is really key actually in terms of women's and children's pathways. Um, actually, you really need your um, emergency department to be able to um, be close by your, your pediatric services so that specialists and things are co-located. You can get those opinions and actually improve that pathway. Um, outdoor space as well, um, which um, is really exciting and to be able to provide that to um, ensure that um, we uh, provide holistic care um, for children um, and our elderly patients, those patients who have dementia, um, sensory gardens as part of that, um, which is really important um, within their care. Looking at the imaging um, as well, that's readily um, accessible as well um, across all key areas. Um, and I've given some examples around why uh, co-location of uh, imaging is, is really important in terms of treatment pathways. And again, planning for future growth um, and really looking at that expansion um, of uh, diagnostics um, and imaging across our sites. So thinking about the um, considerations um, from the pandemic, and uh, as you saw, um, Vicky, um, our ITU matron, referred to some of that in, uh, in her slide. Um, so really thinking about the design um, considerations, so importance of emergency and planned care separation across our sites, and that is really important in terms of infection control. Um, and uh, I think we should be really mindful of that in terms of what we've learned from the pandemic so that we're able, by that separation, um, able to run planned care services completely separate to the emergency so we've got different flows of patients. So in the pandemic, in terms of being um, infectious and things that, that we actually have different pathways for people to move through so that we don't have um, concerns around uh, infection as part of that. And you'll see here around um, green and blue zones, um, green being clean zones, um, blue um, being zones where um, infection. So from a COVID pandemic point of view, a blue zone would be where actually patients are coming through an emergency route. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know that they had COVID until you tested them. However, on a green zone for planned care, you are, you are testing people in advance, um, you have a very planned um, pathway as part of that. Um, really thinking about, um, you know, the routes that people take across the organisation um, and the importance of single rooms. We will see um, much more single rooms uh, across the organisation, which really supports us in terms of um, being able to manage infection prevention control. 
because these single rooms will have ensuite facilities um, so that we can um, provide excellent treatment whilst also um, being able to provide um, isolation uh, facilities in a much better environment as well. Um, being able to um, cluster beds within um, the wards as well so that we have flexibility so that we can zone patients should we need to as part of an outbreak um, and being able to zone in the sense that you could uh, zone the ward so that you've got separate uh, sluice facilities and those aspects and things to be able to, to manage that to reduce um, any cross infection um, to the best of your ability. And of course, ventilation. Ventilation is really important here in terms of the number of air changes and managing infection prevention control. But I suppose actually bringing this into the round is really about being able to use the environment flexibly to, to be able to manage whatever happens um, you know, going forward into the future um, to make sure that actually you provide excellent environment for staff and for patients. So further things around patient uh, experience. So as we've talked about a bit already is uh, grouping related services together so that patients can have tests and treatments that they need um, in one place. Um, minimizing the need to move um, between different parts of the hospital as well um, so that we can reduce um, infection um, as well as part of that. Um, increasing the number, as I've said, of single inpatient rooms um, and really having the opportunity to provide much better privacy and dignity, creating calming and healing environments that look after people's physical health and promotes good mental health and well-being. And that includes the outdoor spaces um, as part of that and spiritual and pastoral care, along with um, art um, as well. So really designing spaces that are welcoming and accessible to all. So further opportunities. Um, I think, um, you know, if I think about this slide, um, you know, being able to um, resolve issues and um, that concern staff, such as training opportunities and clinical cover, standardizing our spaces, <clears throat> so they're more consistent um, in terms of the ward and room layouts, which is really good for staff as they move around the organization. If actually, you know, wards um, are laid out in the same way, it makes it much easier for staff to be able to go to that area um, and be able to work um, in the same way because we're reducing variation as part of that. Um, on the job training um, as well. Um, and really having improved um, spaces to be able to do that. Um, looking at new roles um, within our workforce um, and, and particularly within our, um, what we call our clinical support services such as um, diagnostics and pharmacy. And focusing on staff wellbeing, um, which is a guiding principle for everything that we do. Um, so making sure that people have got good rest spaces, changing facilities, um, supporting people in terms of how they, um, you know, get to work. So if they, you know, ride their bikes and things that they've got decent facilities to be able to store their bikes as well. Um, but this is also really important as part of our volunteers as well. And our volunteers, you know, give their time very generously to us and they are the lifeblood um, of the organisation. Um, and it actually really makes the hospital part of the local community. And so we're really keen um, to start delivering care from modern um, surroundings and our staff are so engaged in this as well. Um, and looking at the latest technology um, that's really going to help them um, work differently and provide, you know, excellent services um, within what we would call first class facilities. Thank you, Tracy. You. I, thank you. I was glad to see you had a bottle of water there because you've got you've got the questions are really coming in thick and fast. Um, so you've 
you've got a few questions already, but there, there's been plenty more coming. So we will try to get through them all and we might need to be quite uh, brief with the answers also. So as I've said before, all the documents are on our website. Please do take a look. They have been really thoughtfully put together. I mean, they all come from the, the minds of our clinicians. They're not sort of management documents despite the pandemic being a huge um, strain on us, our clinicians were so keen to get involved and so ambitious for their services and for the well-being of our patients. So we have had really good engagement and that's, that's where our proposals have come from. Um, we can come out to you, as I've said, we can translate documents. We have printed copies as well of our survey and um, you can see the link to the survey there. We would really like a good take up of our survey across all the areas that we cover. So please can I encourage you to work your way through it. It won't take you very long, I promise, but it's really important for us to hear your views. So uh, now we are just going to move into questions and Tracy, they're all gonna be for you. Uh, I will answer what I can, but people are very interested as you can see. So can I start you off with um, a question about recruitment? It may have sounded like we're going to be doing an awful lot more. Um, in fact, I think we're going to be doing a little bit more, but doing it an awful lot differently. Um, but could you just um, talk about future recruitment and any concerns you may have about recruitment of nurses? Thank you. Thank you. So we've done a lot of work around recruitment um, over the preceding years. And um, at this time, um, I have very few vacancies um, and have been at uh, zero vacancies in adult nursing um, uh, since um, a couple, about 18 months, two years ago now. Um, we have reduced our turnover of staff as part of that. So I, I would see that um, as part of our overall plan, we've continued with our international recruitment and we've really seen really, really good increased numbers um, into training as well. So I would absolutely see that we have some fantastic opportunities in terms of uh, student nurse numbers coming through um, and midwives. And as many of you will know, they take over three years to train. So um, really good opportunities um, as part of that. Um, so I don't see that um, in terms of our services that we will necessarily need be needing to recruit um, huge amounts more um, staff because actually we're going to be working very differently. We're going to be using technology um, as part of that and actually looking at how we work as a as a team. But I think that um, in terms of recruitment, um, I don't have any concerns um, around nursing um, and support workers as part of that. Um, and I think in terms of midwifery, um, we continue um, to recruit around midwifery services um, and are looking at a number of different ways um, that we can um, support in terms of training um, and encouraging um, registered nurses actually to um, do their 18 month course um, and uh, develop into a midwife as well as looking at further maternity care support worker roles. So really developing support workers to work at a, a much higher level, but also this is a fantastic development opportunity and, and, and good for the local community, I think as well. Um, so really working with local schools and things as well. So, um, you know, um, making sure that we've got jobs for local people as well. Thank you, Tracy. And can I add that we were the, um, voted as the best UK employer, um, was that 20, 2019? 2019, yes. 2019, which was a, a real feather in our cap. So I think we do, we do uh, benefit from good word of mouth and our um, career development does mean that our nursing staff can develop their careers with us rather than to have to leave us for the next, next promotion. Um, and, and I was going to say, as part of that, Louise, we've really developed a huge number of new roles and things as well. So people are able to um, continue to develop their careers, but in different ways and not then the opportunities around that. 
We could do a whole presentation on this, we as, can, you, as, you, as you can tell, but um, I've got some more questions that are related to our proposals. And in the presentation, we talk about um, clinicians moving and not the patient. I think a good example of that is, is something that we use in our jargon. Uh, we, we call it SDEC, but Tracy can talk to you about same day emergency care and give you a flavour of how if we if we can change the way that we staff our, our hospitals and the services that we put in there, we can really have services where the staff move to the patient. So Tracy, I wondered if SDEC, uh, same day emergency care was a good example, or if you have another of clinicians moving to fit themselves around the, the patient. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of um, same day emergency care, that's, that's a really good, uh, um, a good example where actually um, all of those services are um, co-located so that, um, you know, patients don't have to move far around the organisation. They can have their diagnostics, they can have their assessment and actually the relevant specialist clinicians move around them in terms of um, reviewing those diagnostics around look and then um, the relevant clinicians looking at the results of those and being able to um, assess the patient and talk to them about their um, treatment options and undertaking those there and then um, so that um, people have a much better um, experience as well rather than um, patients then having to move around the organization to see relevant clinicians actually the clinicians are rotating around you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I've got a question about the um, infection prevention and control and how that would be managed during our redevelopment. And I, and I guess before you come in with the detail, it's important to remind people that particularly at the Watford site, we are talking about new, a new building that is adjacent to our current building. So we don't anticipate um, doing the rebuild around where patients are um, actually being cared for. But um, Tracy is definitely the best person to answer questions on um, really keeping our infection um, prevention and control as good as it can be during redevelopment. Tracy, over to you. So um, I think, you know, because we work in quite a difficult environment, we're actually really used to um, being able to provide excellent infection prevention control services. Um, and what's fundamental to that is education, training um, and the basics around hand hygiene um, and how we move between patients and the personal protective equipment that we wear as part of that. Um, we have uh, a number of things, processes and things in place to look at our ventilation and our air changes. Um, we have um, audits which would continue around how we're providing infection prevention control. So I wouldn't envisage that anything would change in, in terms of that in the whilst we're moving through um, redevelopment and infection prevention control work hand in glove with um, the environment team as well. So they would be assessing um, any building work um, any impact that might have on infection prevention control um, and we would be looking at that all the time as we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you Tracy and sticking with uh, infection prevention and control do you think there is any difference between um, the level um, that you can attain whether it's a new build or whether it's uh, a rebuild? Thank you. Can you explain that again? Yes, so um, I think the worry is that um, if we are in a building, if we have buildings that are refurbished instead of brand new, is infection prevention and control any worse as a result of not having brand new buildings? That's a good question. And um, I think in, you know, there can be a difference um, because actually, you know, having um, having single rooms with on um, suites can make a huge difference to managing infection prevention control, um, flow of um, people through the organisation, whether that be patients or visitors. 
Um, and that can just be through how we um, manage um, co-location of services on what floors they're on and how the lift facilities get people to those areas um, as part of that. So actually refurbishing can make a difference um, in terms of maybe not being able to um, provide single rooms, maybe not being able to provide the space required um, between beds and things as well um, as part of that. So a new build can really support us, but also coming back to things like ventilation, mechanical ventilation with, and air changes um, as well are extremely important in managing um, infection prevention control, um, especially um, as part of uh, a new build. And we've got some you know, um, really good opportunities as part of that. Thank you. And I guess it's important to say that even in the newest building, if the um, training of staff or if if um, what the staff are doing is not good, then, um, you know, you could have the best building in the world and still not have the best infection control. Um, Tracy, you picked up on single occupancy rooms and I've got a question here um, about the percentage. So have we got to that point yet where we've fixed on the, the percentage of single occupancy rooms we would expect to have on the Watford site? So we, we're actually just finalising um, that, but I would expect that we will be um, having over 60% of single rooms within um, ward areas um, as part of that, so that we can really provide um, those uh, facilities. So more privacy, dignity, infection prevention control, um, and also that will support us in terms of what I was talking around, around zoning, around zoning areas as well um, as part of that. But as Louise has rightly pointed out, what is fundamental to all of this is making sure that um, we practice good infection prevention control. So it's actually very much about how we practice as, um, as staff as well um, to support that. But um, yes, I would expect that all of our ward areas and we're fine like, would be at least um, 60%. Um, single rooms. Thank you. Um, Tracy, I'd like to ask you a question, if I may, about inpatient beds at Hemel Hempstead. So just to uh, get the wording as the questioner put it, it is, um, will patients who need an inpatient bed at Hemel Hempstead Hospital be cared for by CLCH, which is Central London Community Healthcare? I, I think I've got that right, but, um, but you understand the question. It's really if you could broaden out a little bit about inpatient care at Hemel Hempstead Hospital and, and who provides it, that would be great. Thank you. So um, inpatient care at Hemel Hempstead is, is a community based um, service. Um, is, it's not a, it would not be an, an acute um, service. So absolutely, this would be for um, people who are rehabilitating um, and requiring um, a bit of a further stay, um, but not um, needing an, an acute admission um, as part of that. And that would mean that actually they would be looked after as part of community services. But I think what's fundamentally important here is, is working in partnership with all of our um, you know, community providers and others so that we provide an end-to-end -end pathway um, for our patients. Um, whether that be by us or whether that be by community services, this is about providing the right pathway for our patients across our sites. Thank you, Tracy. Completely different question now, which is about our rest facilities. So would you envisage in our, in our new buildings and our refurbished buildings that there will be rest facilities for family carers, parents um, and and relatives, anyone really who is needed to support the care of patients, non-staff? Non mm. I, I would, I would expect that we have um, really good baby changing um, facilities uh, across our, our sites. Um, um, as, as part of that, I would, um, changing places um, as well, which is um, for people that maybe are adults um, and have, um, disability and being able to access those types of um, services, spaces uh, for them and their carers um, as part of that. And I would expect that because of the um, 
size of the, the hospitals and the space that we will have available to us, that actually there will be facilities for um, families, for carers to be able to rest. I talked a little bit about some of our outside spaces that will be available for people to rest and recuperate in. Um, and that's not just our staff, that is families and carers as well as part of that. Um, restaurant facilities. Um, and, and being able to um, access um, food at, at different times um, as part of that. Um, so whether you're a father um, who's just had, you know, just had the most wonderful experience of their life as a baby's been born and uh, being able to access facilities at all times of the, the day and night, um, or whether you're here with a loved one, maybe in the, in the last hours of their, of their life, that you're able to be able to um, have space to be able to rest um, and recuperate and access, um, you know, refreshments um, as required. And I think, our, you know, our new building will really offer those services um, to people. Thank you, Tracy. And there will also be a hotel within the redevelopment as well. So Riverwell, um, which is the regen regeneration area that um, that the hospital will be part of, um, will also have hotel facilities. That's not available in, in everybody's pocket, but for people who choose to, who want to, um, there will be other facilities and it overall will be a more pleasant environment to visit um, than it is currently. So I've got a question about separation um, between um, facilities for younger children and teenagers, Tracy, and we know, don't we, that our wax building, um, as proud as we are of the service, there's a queue of people who would like to operate the bulldozer to get rid of that one. So we've got big ambitions for our women and children's services and the building that they're going to go in. But I'll let Tracy assure you about the separation um, between facilities for uh, children and teenagers. Tracy. Thank you. Um, we absolutely recognise the um, importance of um, the age plays in children's services um, and being able to offer facilities that um, have sensory spaces um, for children of all ages, but also recognise that, um, you know, adolescents need something quite different. Um, and making sure that they've also got um, space where they're with peers, um, where they're not with smaller children, access to technology um, and services um, around them so that um, they can really um, improve their um, experience as part of that. So we've got, we've got some, um, you know, opportunities as we design our services actually to make sure that they're fit um, for young children um, as well as our, um, our older children, such as our teenagers, so, you know, our 13, 14, 15 year olds um, that require something quite different as part of their care. Thank you. Um, going back to rest facilities, we talked about facilities for staff. Um, do you think in the new um, designs that we will also incorporate facilities for our much loved volunteers to have a breather? So I actually see our volunteers as, 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 as part, part and parcel of the organisation. As I said earlier, they're lifeblood of the organisation. And I would expect that all of our staff facilities are actually for our volunteers as well. They are, they are part and parcel of our teams, um, integral to what we do every day. So I would absolutely see that um, some of the spaces that I've spoken about would be areas where our volunteers can rest and recuperate as well. Um, so I've talked about quiet spaces um, available, which will have um, sort of sensory lights and things in there, um, as well as more functional staff spaces where people can prepare their meals, have a good chat um, about things and, and, and socialize with each other. Um, and I would see that our volunteers would benefit from those spaces as well along with areas such as our spiritual and pastoral care spaces. Thank you, Tracy. Um, can I ask you a question related to um, a pandemic or sort of considering uh, that there may be another pandemic? And the question is whether or not we would require staff from Hemel Hempstead and St Albans to transfer to Watford and how might this impact on our um, non-elective procedures? It's 
possible that the questioner means elective procedures. So maybe if you could uh, just talk about how um, in a pandemic we would expect to need um, our staff from other hospitals to come onto the site at Watford. So in a pandemic, it, it, it means we have to provide quite different services um, to actually um, be able to meet, meet the needs um, of, our, of our patients and our local community as part of that. And that, that could mean at times that actually our staff um, need to work flexibly um, to support those needs, um, which may well be centralised on more on one site um, as part of that. We've known through this pandemic, because of the um, volume of people who have become unwell, um, and have come through our services that we have required staff to actually be able to be centralised um, and work as a team. Um, and some of that isn't just about um, needing to move people over to one site to work, you know, to provide a central service. This is also about actually our staff have been impacted by the pandemic. Our staff have not been well. Um, this is also about availability of staff um, to be able to work as a team and provide the services that we require. If I take an example such as intensive care, where we've had to increase um, our intensive care um, footprint to be able to provide the um, service um, required by our local community and to be able to do that, We've, you know, we have um, asked our staff to work flexibly to support intensive care so that we could provide the safest care in a pandemic um, for our community, because actually the, the care that's required is very different to normal times and the number of people that require it. So there may well be times when actually we would ask our staff to work very flexibly as part of um, what is actually an emergency situation. Um, and remembering that we are in a level four incident nationally as a pandemic, which does actually mean that we're, we're running um, uh, as an emergency. And that does mean that we have to work very, very differently as part of that. But I also think, you know, with some of the redevelopment and the opportunities to separate flows um, as part of that around planned, um, so elective services and emergency services, that we may well actually be able to um, mean that we can cut some of that down um, in terms of how we provide those services and the, and the uh, flexibility of staff movement with the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. Thank you, Tracy. And of, uh, of course, we've been quite um, glad of having our separate sites during during this time because we've now restarted a lot of our routine surgery at St Albans um, so for us there is um, there is some benefit or, or a lot of benefit actually in separation and um, if you've joined us on the other sessions you will have also heard some of our other uh, clinical colleagues talking about the importance of being able to continue elective work so planned work at another site and that the separation sort of protects it from some of the pressures that come from an emergency um, service on the same site. And that can sometimes mean that your operating theatres are taken over or that your clinicians are pulled um, in, into um, procedures or to assist. And so the separation does allow the two separate streams of services to, to run um, effectively separately rather than impacting on each other. So I'm just looking at my questions and I, I think we have now covered everything. Um, if you have further questions, well, you can always join another session. There's plenty to choose from. Uh, we're trying to keep you uh, busy during these times of um, fewer social um, activities. So if you wanted to uh, learn more about endoscopy, then you could join us tomorrow and we will be discussing the model of care at St Albans City Hospital. And on Friday, we will be talking about our plans for women's and children's services. So Tracy touched on those, but there's so much more that we could talk to you about on that particular topic. Um, we're going to let you uh, relax over the weekend, but we hope you'll be with us again on Monday. Uh, and then you can see Vicky Houghton 
in the flesh. We saw a picture of her earlier and she'll be talking about critical care at Watford General Hospital. Um, moving on, um, another person whose face appeared briefly is Dr. Sandeep Balara, and he can talk um, with real enthusiasm about our model for care at Hemel Hempstead Hospital. He is exceptionally proud of the work that's gone in to the plans for that hospital and is very confident that it will provide a much improved experience for our patients. So if you're particularly interested in that, then um, you could join us next Tuesday also at six o'clock or invite uh, myself or one of my colleagues to come and run through uh, a broad overview presentation with you. We're very happy to do that. And as well, just tell us what you think. Please take part in our survey and uh, keep joining us if you can for future sessions. So I'd like to thank Tracy for her time this evening and to thank you for your time also. Good night.